Okay, this is uh, a lecture for my eighth hour class on the 30th of March. Anyway, if you just look at that, for, that name or that word, Teddy the Trust Buster, uh, you would think that all that Roosevelt did when he was president was sit around and try and figure out ways to destroy trusts. And get this down, he did break up 44 trusts or 44 monopolies. He broke them up. He said they're too big, they're too big, they're illegal, they're killing competition. We're going to do away with them. But Roosevelt didn't hate all monopolies. Get this down. I want you to write down Roosevelt's view of monopolies. Uh, he believed that there were good monopolies and bad monopolies. And what did he think about good monopolies? What did he think? Of, well, let me ask you this. What do you think he thought a good monopoly was? I gave back to the community. Okay. Maybe he gave charitable donations to the community. What else did the monopoly do? What, what, what else could a good monopoly do? Can you think of any monopolies today close to where you're sitting? Walmart. Walmart. I mean, now, technically it's not, but I think in, in some ways Walmart would qualify as a monopoly. It's a world organization. It's a worldwide. Is it a, what would Teddy Roosevelt say about monopoly? What <laughs> Roosevelt say about Walmart, excuse me? Good or bad? Good. Why? Does it provide a service for the community? Yes. We got to live without it. I mean, everything you want. We got to go to Walmart. Okay. Does it provide jobs? Yes. Tens of thousands of jobs. Do they pay a living wage? Yes. I think mean, in most instances they pay a living wage. I think they're some of the first people. The standard minimum wage is seven twenty-five or something an hour. I think they're one of the first one of the first companies to go um, go. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, they're one of the first companies to go to uh, $15 an hour. This is, the, this is the last test we took. Is that what you're here to do? I think that's Friday. Right. You need to go next door. No, I'm going to be talking here. So anyway. Um, anyway, I think Roosevelt would say, what would he say about Microsoft? I think you say that's a good monopoly. They pay their taxes, they obey the law. You get a job at Microsoft, you're not gonna be working for minimum wage. You're gonna have you're gonna make a you know what was the square deal all about? Making sure that everybody got a living wage. If you worked, you had a decent life. That's what a living wage is. You weren't starving to death. People aren't starving to death who work for Microsoft. So I think Roosevelt, even though it's this big, gigantic company, even though it's put some smaller computer companies out of business, I think Teddy Roosevelt would say that's a good monopoly and he would leave it alone. If it's good for the community, if it's good for the people, if it's good for the country, leave it alone. However, bad monopolies, what did Roosevelt say about that? Get rid of them. You write that down. And he got rid of 44 of them. He got rid of 44 of them. Okay? And during his presidency. Uh, the most famous monopoly case, get this all down, keep right on writing. The most famous case, the most famous monopoly that Roosevelt shut down was the Northern Securities case. Northern Securities. That sounds pretty fancy schmancy. It was a railroad. Get this down. But anything, it was a railroad, RR. Anything that happened to a railroad in this country was important because the railroad moved America. Today, the automobile moves America. But in, in 1900, it was the, uh, it was the railroad. And it was a great trust. Get this now, I want you to know a few basic facts about it. It was in the northwestern part of the United States. Uh, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, okay? Uh, and there were three men who owned all the railroads up there. And they competed against each other. With me, three men on every railroad in the Northwest. If you wanted to ship crops, if you wanted to go somewhere, you had to deal with it. And then it finally dawned on them, why don't we just come together and form one gigantic railroad? And they did. And what was that called? A trust. It was called a trust. And they formed a trust. And they owned it all. And Roosevelt said, that's illegal. And he told his attorney general, who's the head of the Justice Department, to go after the Northern Securities Company and get this down. They broke it up. If you're ever looking for an example of Teddy Roosevelt and a bad 
what he considered what he considered to be a bad monopoly that he broke up or a bad trust. There's a perfect example of it. And he didn't stop there. You got to keep right on writing. He didn't stop there. Railroads were so important to this country. Roosevelt said, <clears throat> we have to regulate. Who does he mean by we? Huh? The government. Get this down. The government has to regulate the railroads. You can't just let the railroads run on their own. You can't let the owners of the railroads run the railroads completely. There have to be rules, and the only people that can enforce those rules uh, is the government. So with that in mind, Roosevelt proposed a law called the Hepburn Act. Always remember that the Hepburn Act is associated with railroads. The Hepburn Act and what the Hepburn and the Congress passed it and Roosevelt signed it into law. He didn't just declare it. Presidents can't do that. Well, they can sometimes, but not on something like this. And what this did, and this is still in effect, I think, what this did is that it uh, created a seven-person board. The people were appointed by the president, and they regulated the railroads. They made sure that the railroads did not overcharge farmers to ship their crops. They made sure that the railroad was safe. You know, some of these railroad companies, to cut back on costs so they would make more profit, they would have a long, long train full of people, and the only car on that railroad that would have brakes would be the engine. And people would say to them, why don't you put air brakes on every car? So if this train has to stop all of a sudden, it can shut down all at once. And they'd say, are you nuts? That would cost too much money. That would cut into our profit. Well, guess what? These people made them put the air brakes on the train, and it made train travel very safe. Now, I know I could stand up here and talk to you all day about train travel, and you would go, ho oh, hum, so what? Because the train isn't nearly as nearly significant today as it was. Uh, but this is like government regulating cars. By the way, the government, does the government regulate automobiles today? In what sense? Uh, seat belts. What? Seat, seat belts. belts. Anything else? Uh, like emissions. Uh, huh? Emissions of vehicles. Emissions. That's that's the big one. Emissions. That's exactly true. So anyway, in a sense, you can compare that. But the Hepburn Act was to control uh, the railroads. Okay. So the government must protect the people's interests against the big corporations. Uh, Roosevelt also moved. Get this down. Roosevelt also moved to clean up the meatpacking industry. He read whose book? And it literally made him sick. After he read the book, he had to get up, walk out of the room, and throw up in a trash can. Uh, Upton, Upton Sinclair. Sinclair. Do any of you remember this book? Upton Sinclair, The Jungle? Do you remember that? The, muck, the Muckraker? Upton Sinclair? Well, anyway, uh, yeah, he read Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle. And I want to talk to you about what that book was about. I just want to give you the story. And for once, you don't have to take notes. I just want you to sit there, and I want you to listen. But I want you to sit up and pay attention. This is not a free day. Uh, anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a fictional story based on fact. If you read this book, you get a picture of what the food processing industry in 1900 was like. It's the story of a family that immigrated to the United States from Lithuania, uh, and they end up in Chicago, and the only job the whole family can get was in a slaughterhouse. That must be one of the worst jobs in history, in a slaughterhouse. Uh, and the people who owned this big slaughterhouse, you know, here was the slaughterhouse where all these people worked 60 hours a week. And just right next to it, they built a bunch of little shacks, and their workers had to live in those shacks. And they paid those workers $300 a year, 300 a year. Think about that. They're working... 60 hours a week, figure this out sometimes, 60 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, didn't get any days off, 52 weeks a year, uh, and they're paid $300 a year. Uh, that was not a penny an hour uh, that they were paid. Uh, and with the, that small salary that they made to live in one of these little shacks, <clears throat> they had to pay the company rent. So it's a horrible, horrible uh, situation. And get this down. Well, you don't have to get this down in this book. By the way, they hired children to work because children would work for a hundred dollars a year. Imagine little children working in some place as unsafe as one of these uh, great uh, slaughterhouses. 
<clears throat> so children only made, and, and by the way, sometimes uh, when the whole family came into work, if they had a teenage daughter or younger, they, the, the, the foreman there on the floor would look and say, hey, you know, why don't you let me give your daughter a job at my house? My wife needs a maid, and we'll pay her, and she'll live in this nice house with us. And of course, I think you can see how this story ends. He ended up uh, selling the girl uh, into prostitution, okay? Lest you think child trafficking is new, the 21st century is the only time that the American people have had to deal with such a thing. No, that's as old as the human race. Uh, there are all sorts of different illustrations. One child in the book, and this is in Chicago, one child worked, walked to work in the winter, and he was so cold that when he got inside the plant, he went and stood next to a wood-burning stove to try and warm up before he started working, and he tried to rub his ears to get the circulation going in his ears again, uh, and his ears fell off. There was one small boy who the worker, the adults working there every afternoon, they would send him down to the saloon with a bucket and say, get us a bucket of beer, and the little boy would take a few nips of beer. Well, that day he took too many. He's 10 or 12 years old, uh, and he uh, laid down in a corner and passed out. He was drunk. He laid down in the corner and passed out. And that day when they shut the plant down, everybody forgot that that little boy was in there. Uh, and the next morning when they came and they opened up the plant, uh, his face was missing. Rats had swarmed over him, and they had eaten, they had eaten his face. Okay? Uh, and, of course... Uh, every night, you know, if a worker was a minute late, he was docked an hour's pay. If a worker was two hours late, then he was fired. There were thousands of unemployed people that stood at the gate 12 hours a day waiting for someone to be fired. And, of course, the place was, this is where they're processing meat for people to eat. The place was literally overrun with rats. Uh, it worked like this. There were these large walkways, platforms, like this. large platforms like this and on the side there were these huge big kettles with boiling water and they would kill a cow or several cows and they would come and they could put those things were big enough to put two cows in boiling at the same time and eventually eventually they would Eventually, they would uh, the meat would boil off of the bones and rise to the top, and they hired men to walk up and down this platform with these big rake-like things and scoop the meat out, uh, and then they would go back and scoop the skeletons out. Okay, in the morning, the first thing, or excuse me, at night before they shut the plant down, the first thing they did is that they sent young boys to cover this whole platform, and they've got these platforms all throughout this slaughterhouse. They're processing thousands of cattle every day. But the last thing they did at night is that they sent these boys with rat poison to sprinkle poison there. And the next morning, when they opened up the plant, there were all these big, fat, dead rats on this platform. And so the boys, their first job in the morning was to sweep it off to clear the platform so these guys could walk up and down and turn these cows or pigs or sheep or whatever it was uh, that were, was boiling. Uh, and they would just sweep those dead rats along with pieces of rope and rat poison right in the vats, and it would be processed with the meat, and they would can the meat, and you might, three weeks later, in Peoria, go to the store and buy uh, a, a can of canned meat. Just, okay, thanks. Uh, tell them to just leave those over there. I'll collect them. Thanks. Anyway. <laughs> They would sweep all that dead rats and all that. You open up your can of meat and there would be a claw or there would be a tail or there would be hair in it, a dead rat. Sometimes the men who were walking up and down those floors turning those boiling cattle over uh, would slip and they would fall in the vats themselves. And they didn't fish them out. Uh, they just boiled them and they packed the, that human being in canned meat. Uh, it was absolutely, it was absolutely uh, filthy. One Chicago newspaper made a joke out of this. They wrote this about the slaughterhouses of America, and I quote, Mary had a little lamb, and when she saw it sicken, she shipped it to Chicago, and now it's labeled chicken, end quote. Well, Upton Sinclair, yes. So wait, uh, with the, like, didn't you say they, like, we sweep even the rat poison in there? Yeah. That, like, kill her? Uh, sure, people are dying. This, this is the problem. This is one of the this is the problem Upton Sinclair is pointing out. People are dying all over America because of this. Okay? Yeah, that's, that's what he's pointing out. He's letting people know this is why the meat that you eat 
uh, is killing you. And who's he calling on to fix that, by the way? Roosevelt. Huh? Roosevelt. Well, more than Roosevelt, the government. The government. That's exactly true. Um, the, um, uh, I thought it was something to say, and I, it's already slipped my mind. But anyway, um, oh, yeah, there were, by the way, there were government inspectors in these plants. You know, once in a while you go down to McDonald's and you'll look back there and there'll be someone who is wearing a hard hat and they've got a white coat on. Walking, they're inspecting that place to make sure that the food they're serving you, the people wash their hands, the place is clean, and so you won't buy a Big Mac and you know c contract a tomain uh, two uh, two uh, weeks later. Uh, but and there were government inspectors in these slaughterhouses as well. So how did they get away? How did these big companies get away with doing this? They paid them off. That's exactly right. They bribed them to look the other way, and they looked the other way. So uh, that's what Upton Sinclair uh, points out in his book. He said, this is laissez-faire. This is capitalism without rules, and government must take a role in protecting the food supply of the country. Now you can pick up your pencils. Roosevelt got sick. And he immediately sent a bill to the Congress to clean up America's food supply. And it's one of the reasons why, like I say, if you buy food, you don't have to worry that it's going to kill you, although sometimes it still does cause problems. But Roosevelt's bill was the Pure Food and Drug Act. Write that down. The Pure Food and, Pure food and Drug Act, okay? And the Congress passed it. And I want you to know what the Pure Food and Drug Act said. The Pure Food and Drug Act said... Act said that if you bottle something and sell it, if you can something and you sell it, if you put something in a package and you sell it, bottle, can, or package something, all the ingredients of that bottle, can, or package have to be on the label so you can read it. Someday when you have absolutely nothing to do, you're walking through a grocery store, just grab a can of green beans and read the label and see they have a list of ingredients that long. And now it's even more than that. Everything in that can is listed so the consumer can read it. And now it's even more than that because now they have salt content, carbohydrates, uh, sodium, you name it. Everything in that can uh, to ensure the safety of the American people. And the meat processing and food processing companies in this country uh, are clean, okay? They are clean. You can think, think roast is generally clean. Sometimes somebody uh, breaks the law and gets away with some stuff and people die and it makes all the newspapers and that company is shut down and the people running it go to jail. You can thank Roosevelt and Upton Sinclair for that. Well, okay, I want to leave that now, talking about Teddy Roosevelt, and I want to go to the environment. Write that down. We're in a big debate in this country today over the environment. And global warming, well, that's nothing new. The environment, I'll just spell that. <clears throat> the environment. Roosevelt was our first, you know, today, if you are concerned with the environment, if you think we ought to clean up the air and clean up the water and not pollute, uh, if you're concerned with that, uh, you, are, you might be called uh, a green, okay? There's actually a party that nominates a candidate for president. It's called the Green Party. They're interested in environmental issues. Roosevelt, get this down. I'm going to step out here and get me another marker. Roosevelt was our first Green President. Okay. Okay, Roosevelt was our first green president. He was concerned with the environment. Now, up until Teddy Roosevelt, get this down, up until Teddy Roosevelt, and by the way, Teddy Roosevelt is the first president of which century? The 20th, okay. So up until the 20th century, 
the century we just finished, up until the 20th century, people have this attitude that America's natural resources would never wear out. When uh, the Europeans, when the British first started establishing Jamestown Colony in Virginia, right there on the coast, they planted tobacco. Tobacco is one of the worst crops. It destroys the soil, but they weren't worried about that. You could just, when you wore out the soil here, and you polluted the water here, you could just go five miles west and just keep going west and keep going west and keep going west. But by the time Teddy Roosevelt became president, get this now, uh, uh, we had run out of new territory. The west was settled. The west was settled. And Roosevelt realized that uh, if, our, if we did not start, get this down, if we did not start conserving our natural resources, our trees, our farmland, our water, our animals, that we would run out. In fact, which animal almost became extinct when Roosevelt almost single-handedly saved it? Buffalo. The buffalo. Yeah, when Teddy Ro you know, just before Teddy Roosevelt became president, there were 200 buffalo out of a herd that had once been 60 million. Roosevelt said, we've got to preserve it and save it. And even though he was a great hunter, he led the effort to do that. And today there are half a million buffalo in this country. You can go and see them. You don't just have to look at them on a screen. Okay? He said this. Get this down. He said, <clears throat> the forests of this country cannot be left to the lumber companies. Who has to regulate the lumber, lumber companies? The government. Write that down. He is a progressive. The government. And I want you to write this down too. There, the one issue, you know, Theodore Roosevelt was a practical politician. He knew that to get what you wanted, you sometimes had to compromise. But Roosevelt, the, the one issue, out of all the issues, the one issue that Teddy Roosevelt would not compromise on was the environment. Write that down. On the environment. He wouldn't do it. In fact, he, one of the first things he did as president, is that he created a place in the cabinet. I don't know I have a picture. You know what the cabinet is? You know what the, you know what the president's cabinet is? Well, you it's not too people that are shaking their head. I'm not even asking. No, I don't know. Don't ask me. No, I don't. Ooh, my brain didn't work. You know what the cabinet is? Like people that advise. Yes, you know. Do you think when we when's the last time we elected a farmer's president of the United States? <laughs> well, well, you should. You should. It was in 1976. His name is Jimmy Carter. He's dying tragically now. He's dying. He's 98 years old. He was a farmer all of his life. So he knew about it. What about all those guys since Jimmy Carter? Were any of them farmers? I'm guessing not. You're guessing right. Should a president, uh, you know, does a president have to deal with agricultural issues? Yes. How's he going to do that if he's not a farmer? Yes, you know. You, you know. You just told me. Now, what's he going to do? Who's he going to put in his cabinet to advise him? A farmer. That's exactly right. A farmer. Right now, the Secretary of Far uh, Agriculture is a farmer from Iowa. A uh, farm boy all his life. His name is Bill Sack. And President Biden is not a farmer, but he said, "If I have to make it, if I have to make uh, uh, decisions about agriculture and farming, I need someone who's a farmer to advise me." And he uh, appointed Secretary Bill Sack, who sits in the cabinet meetings, and when an agricultural issue comes up, he advises the president. He runs the Department of Agriculture, which is a huge department to help farmers all over this country. That's the cabinet. Most presidents aren't generals. What if a military matter comes up? Who, advi who advises the president on that? The Secretary of, well, we did not anymore. We used to call it that in Roosevelt's day, but the Secretary of Defense, right? Yeah. And who's he? Usually a mil <clears throat> pardon me, a military man. Yeah. The president, you're right. The president's cabinet, they're his advisors, okay? All right. Well, Roosevelt put a man in the cabinet, get his name down. His name was Gifford Pinchot. Gifford Pinchot. And Roosevelt created a spot for him. He made him the chief forester. He put him in charge of the American forest, the chief forester. So you got to regulate those lumber companies. You got to watch those lumber companies. 
By the way, when a lumber company cuts down a forest today, what do they have to do as they're cutting down that forest? Replant trees. Every tree they cut down, they've got to plant another one. This goes right back to this. And by the way, these forests that Roosevelt was talking about, you can still go see them. They're virgin forests. They were the forests when the first human put their dirty foot in this hemisphere, that forest was growing. And you know what the lumber companies wanted to do? They wanted to cut them down. And Roosevelt said, no, we're going to save that for the future generations. Okay? Still in effect. You ever, you ever uh, heard of the giant redwoods out in California? Yeah. You know how tall they were when Jesus was on earth 2,000 years? They were about that tall. Those trees are over 2,000. You know what the lumber companies wanted to do to those magnificent trees? They wanted to cut them down and sell them for lumber. Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot said, no, that's why you can go look at those 2,000-year-old trees today. That's not just a tree. That's a national treasure. And so Roosevelt said, hey, you know, we're, 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 uh, going to, uh, we're going to preserve the environment for future generations. And Gifford Pinchot have to do that. Write this man down right here, too. There's another man. Uh, uh, John Muir, John Muir, and there, there he and there, there's Roosevelt, him standing out in the West, you know. <clears throat> I love this about Roosevelt. He he said there won't be a White House Christmas tree for seven and a half years. We didn't have a White House Christmas tree. Look at that. That's Joe Biden's Christmas tree, the last one. You know what they do? They go out, and there's this beautiful tree growing on the side of a mountain. It took two, in nature 200 years to create that tree, and they cut it down, put it in a truck, drive it all the way to Washington, D.C., put it in a wagon drawn by six white horses, and they pull it up to the White House, and they prop it up and decorate it. And the first lady, there's the booth. That's not the first lady, but she invites guests. She comes over one night, and she flips a switch, and the Christmas tree lights up, and a little choir on the side sings, Hark the Herald Angel Sings. And for 30 days, that magnificent tree that it took nature 200 years to, to create, that magnificent tree stands there, and then at the end of 30 days, what do they do to that tree? They burn it. What a waste. Roosevelt said, no White House Christmas tree. And for seven and a half years, there was no White House Christmas tree. And I say, thank God. I think if you want to have a White House Christmas tree, you ought to have to go to the Dollar General store and buy one of those. A little tree. And that and you can use it year after year and just prop that out in front of the White House and sing your guts out if you want to. Uh, get this down. There, what is that? Great. That's the Grand Canyon. How beautiful. You know that Teddy, get this down. You know that Teddy Roosevelt was president? That hotel company. Companies, hotel chains wanted to blast out part of the sides of the Grand Canyon and build hotels there so when people came to the Grand Canyon they could stay in the hotel. Was that a good idea? My God, what insanity. Look at this. Well, that's a really beautiful picture of the Grand Canyon. Just as nature made it. And Roosevelt was beside himself. Uh, and somebody in his cabinet said to him, probably the Secretary of the Interior, said, Mr. President, <clears throat> You can make the national, you can declare the sides of the Grand Canyon a national monument and nobody can touch it. And that's what Roosevelt did. And that's why you can see that today, just like nature made it millions of years ago. That's millions of years old. What's down in the bottom of the Grand Canyon? Yeah, what's the river? The Arizona River. And for millions of years, the Arizona River has been carving out the Grand Canyon. Okay, for millions of years. And they were going to put hotels on the side of it. How idiotic, how shallow, how idiotic can uh, you be? Well, and then get this down, the Alaskan wilderness. The Alaskan wilderness. Here's Alaska. Look, here's Alaska, the 49th state. And right on the north slope here is what's called the Alaskan wilderness. It's pure. Nobody's touched it. Very few people have been up there. <clears throat> and beneath that snow and ice there, there's oil and coal. In 1900, when Teddy Roosevelt was president, this country operated on coal. And the big coal companies, get this down, the big coal companies wanted to go up there and sink mine shafts down in the ground and mine coal. Mine coal. And... Alaska. This is pure. 
This place looks like it did on creation morning. And Roosevelt said no. And he preserved it. And that's why you can, you know, there aren't many pure places left on the earth. That's one of them. You can still go there today. By the way, a few years ago, 20 years ago, when George Bush was president of the United States, the big oil companies wanted to go up there and drill. By the way, Joe Biden's talking about that right now. And you know what the oil company said? The oil company said, we can drill for oil up on the north slope of Alaska. And when we're through pumping all that oil out, we'll put it back just like it looked. You think they can do that? No. I don't. I worked on an oil rig when I was in college to pay my way through. Dirtiest, filthiest, slimiest things on earth. There's no way they can do it. And you know what my party, the Republican Party, says? Drill, baby, drill. We don't care if we destroy this earth as long as gasoline's cheap. I, I do swear that I believe some people would go stand on top. The, you fall a post office, buck naked, and set their hair on fire if they could save 10 cents a gallon on gasoline. I believe that's, I believe that's absolutely true. That's, that's how small they are. That's how small they are. Well, hopefully Biden and his advisors won't get their way. This comes up every once in a while, and it usually fails. Uh, but anyway, um, the price of gas. You know, gas has only gone up $2 in the last 80 years. Can you think of anything else that's only gone up $2 in the last 80 years? No, you can't. There's nothing else. You're getting gas. You know what they're paying in London for a gallon of gas? Well, the whole world looks at us and thinks we're a bunch of whiny little wimps. You know what they're paying in London for a gallon of gas right now? Nine dollars a gallon. Oh, woo, woo, woo. yeah. Uh, I see. I finally got to a subject that some of you think is important. It's not. Gasoline's going away. You're going to drive an electric car for the rest of your life. <clears throat> you say you won't, but you will. Anyway, uh, Roosevelt saved the Alaskan wilderness. He said no coal mining there. Well, Roosevelt was elected by a landslide. Get this down. Roosevelt was elected by a landslide. In 1904, you know, his first term was three and a half years. He simply, uh, he simply served out the term of, uh, he simply served out the term, excuse me, of uh, William McKinley. Uh, in 1904, he was only 46 years old, and he wins the landslide. The American people loved him. And that meant that in 1908, uh, which he could run again. There were no term limits in those days. But in 1908, he would only be 50 years old. And I know that seems ancient to you, but 50 years old is pretty young for a president. Certainly is if you measure it by presidents we have today. And by the way, listen, get this down. Roosevelt could have been reelected by a landslide in 1908. But in 1904, the night he was reelected in 1904, you know how excitable Roosevelt was? He got caught up in the moment. You know, sometimes he let his mouth engage before he engaged his brain. And people were cheering, and he was out there waving to all of his supporters. Uh, and he made this statement, get it down. And why, and, and I've never read any explanation. I don't think he knew why after he thought about it for two minutes. But he made this statement in 1904. He said, I will not be a candidate for president in 1908. Why he said that? Because he could have been elected president walking away in 1908, but he just said in 1904, I'm not going to do it. Well, by 1908, get this down, he was more popular than ever. He was more popular than ever. He wanted to run in 1908. By 1908, he wanted the presidency so bad, he could taste it. But, good to his word, he said, you know, back in 1904, I said I wouldn't run. I'm not going to run. And instead, you know, he said, I can't. He said, I'm not going to run. He could have won. He could have his for the asking. But instead, he uh, supported his best friend. Write this man down right there. His best friend. That was his best friend for president. His name is William Howard Taft. William Howard Taft. Who was Roosevelt's, you know, he was in Roosevelt's cabinet. We were talking about the Secretary of Defense. He was the Secretary of War. Got that down. Taft was the Secretary of War. And like I say, he was Roosevelt's best friend. And so Roosevelt thought like this. If I can't run, I'll get the office for my best friend. 
And so Taft was nominated by the Republicans, and he's going to win. He's going to win because he was supported by Roosevelt. It's a pretty easy race. Taft wins big time. And uh, there was only one issue. Get this down. There was only really one issue in this campaign that caused Taft any trouble. And that, get this down, that was Taft's religion. Okay, Taft's religion. Taft was a Unitarian. Okay, a Unitarian. What does the word unit mean in math? One. One. Unitarians, get this down, Unitarians believe that there's only one God. Now, Christians say, well, we believe that too. There's only one God. But Christians say that that God appears in three forms. You've got Jesus on the cross talking up to his Father in heaven. The Unitarian would say, if Jesus is on the cross, and he's talking to, that's two gods. And then you got the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit thrown in there. That's three gods. I've often said, if somebody could satisfactorily explain that to me, how, then Christians say, three and one, one is three. Unitarians say you're worshiping more than one God. There's only one God. Uh, and of course, uh, because Taft was a Unitarian, that put him at odds, religiously speaking, with most Americans. And, uh, you know, uh, some people say, we're not going to, you know, I mean, there was a movement that was started. We do, we're, we're, by the way, Unitarians say that Jesus was not God. Can I come to your church next Sunday and say, gee, I mean, I really like what you people are all saying here, and I think I want to join. I've just got one little problem. I don't believe that Jesus is God, but they let me join. Absolutely not. It's a Christian church, for God's sake. What would I go and say something that ridiculous for? You know, uh, Jesus is not the Son of God. You know, Unitarian, you think somebody could be elected president tonight? If they said, we don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God? <coughs> Do you think they could? I don't believe they could. No, I don't believe they could. Well, that's what Tad was saying. Well, Roosevelt was a Christian. Roosevelt believed that Jesus was the Son of God. And so Roosevelt said this. He said, I'm going to go to church with Taft. He said, Taft has the right to think about Jesus Christ or anyone else what he wants to. <coughs> he said, I'm going to go to church with him and show my support for him. And Roosevelt's staff said, don't go. You're, you're the most heroic man in America. It will ruin your reputation to go to that Unitarian church. So Roosevelt went. And he sat in the front row and he sang hymns and they prayed. And he sat right there by his buddy Taft. And guess what? On election day, there were some people that voted against Taft because he didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God. He believed he was a wise and good teacher. I think that's what the Unitarians believe. But uh, they didn't, uh, they didn't uh, uh, believe that Jesus was the Son of God, and Taft didn't believe that, and some people voted against him for that. But overall, Taft won a landslide. He won uh, a, a, a huge victory. And T.R., get this down, T.R. stayed around long enough to see his buddy, his friend, Sworn in. A lot of bus you can get up. Sworn in. There they are on inauguration day. They're at the White House. They're about to get in a carriage and go down Pennsylvania Avenue. And Taft is going to be sworn in as the new president. And Roosevelt hang around to watch all that. Get that down. Get along. Roosevelt hung around to watch that all take place. Then he got this down, he went, he left the country, he went to Akron, he said, I'm going to lion hunting, I'm going to lion hunting, and he will go on a year-long safari in Africa, shooting, uh, slaughtering animals, and he's gone for a year, he leaves in 1909, and he won't come back until 1910, okay, so, when we come back after your test tomorrow, write this down. Write this down. So somebody can tell me. We will take up the Taft administration. We will start the presidency of William Howard Taft. All right.
Where did you take this one? Have you? Okay, well, I can see it. Is that the one from last week? Mm -hmm. Is that the one from last week? Yeah, I thought it was. Yeah, I took that one last week. Because I came in late. Because there was a wreck. Which one are you here to make that? I don't know. You just told me yesterday to come in and make it up. Thank you. 
Two stacks. If you're taking, listen, if you're taking the U.S. History test, U.S. History one, and I think all of you are accepted. So put them out on that side. Okay.
Your lecture still going. Oh, turn that off. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. I never can remember that. Uh, <laughs> 